Resume. Now we're re yeah. Okay, welcome everybody. It's uh, Dr. Alan here. Uh, is not feeling well, so he's asked me to uh, introduce the, the speaker who he was good enough to to, uh, to bring. We have a, a nice coincidence. We both live in Montclair, New Jersey. Uh, it, his hospital is in uh, Cedar Grove. Uh, this is Frank Del Guadio. He is the director of the Department of Health and Rehabilitation in Essex County. Uh, Mr. Del Guadio is a member of the county senior management team from July 2013. He assumed responsibility for the operation of the Essex County Hospital Center, serving in the capacity of director CEO. The hospital is in Cedar Grove, New Jersey, and it provides psychiatric inpatient hospital care for 180 patients suffering from chronic severe mental illnesses. Mr. Del Guadio also oversees the operations of the Essex County Division of Community Health Services. He also provides ongoing support for the crisis intervention team training. In 2014, in cooperation with the Essex County Prosecutor's Office and the Essex County Correctional Facility, the Essex County Hospital Center implemented and coordinated the Essex County Mental Health Jail Diversion Program. The program was expanded in 2018 to include a veteran's mental health jail diversion program utilizing similar evaluation protocol and client services. The title of the presentation is The State of Public Mental Health. Uh, please welcome Mr. DeWatt. Thank you very much for having me today. Um, I, I'm not going to use a PowerPoint presentation because I believe in having a discussion type presentation. I can ask you questions. I expect answers. I don't expect you to know everything, but I'll help you along with those. I have some notes because I don't memorize all statistics, but just a little bit of background of um, what we do at Essex County. Um, I run the Department of Health and Rehabilitation for the county. There's also um, different divisions where we have um, what we call our special child health services. And what they do is early intervention for mostly children with autism, severe autism. Um, that starts at three years old, our early intervention program. So what we do is we have caseworkers that go into the households, um, have meetings at various different locations. And what we do is coordinate the educational services, oversee the medical services with our end, um, but it's a very active program. The majority of all of those services are grant funded. So all of the employees you rely on annual grants in order to keep the program running. It's a real vital um, operation that we run out of the Department of Health. Also our Department of Health, we have oversight of all recycling and solid waste regulation. And you do have the ability to levy fines, um, which we also do. And I'm talking about career paths, for example. Some of you are looking to when you graduate, but things of that nature. Um, you have the intoxicated driver program. So if you get pulled over for DWI, you must come and complete a course, and we administer that program. Now that program has run all through fines. That's how public sector works, basically. There's not a lot of funding available, so you have to get creative on how to get your employees in. And uh, unfortunately, that program is enormously successful. But uh, I say unfortunately because there's a lot of people who are mandated to take the courses. So um, basically what I want to do in an overview today, I want to talk about some very politically charged subject matters, which is mental illness, one, in the public setting and also um, general. Uh, with that, what goes along with that is suicide, which is a very hot topic because of you've had the celebrity suicides recently. It gets a lot of attention, but right now we're not hearing a lot about that. Uh, we'll talk about substance abuse and addiction. We'll talk about mental health in the jail population and also talk about medical marijuana and the use for treating mental illness. Okay, I am not a physician, so I'm just gonna give you some of the statistical background and some of the thoughts around this and um, throw in some stories along the way which are all true, they're not, they're not false stories. No. So statistics from the National uh, Mental Health Alliance say that one in five Americans suffer from mental illness. So how many do we have in this room? 
<laughs> go look around the room. Now, it comes in all different forms. But the thing about mental illness is it's very difficult to treat. Right? It's not as if you take a CAT scan in your chest, you have an obstruction, you know exactly the procedure you need to treat that. Mental illness is really, it's kind of like throwing a dart at a dartboard and seeing what you hit. There's so many different diagnoses. Right? And with that, a lot of the medications all have disclaimers on them. And they'll say, may not give you the intended use. Okay, we're going to use this to treat schizophrenia. But you know what? It may not get the same result. Um, and what you have seen over time, a lot of you see the mass, um, what you call warehousing of the mentally ill. We have thousands of patients in these psychiatric facilities. A lot of those are closed. However, the housing options out there are just not available. And that's what we do on the public side. We have 180 patients. We have a full census every day. We have a waiting list of 30 to 35. Most of these people are chronic, severe mental illness, where you could talk to somebody and they kind of look like you and I. You, you really wouldn't know until you talk to them. And you're starting to hear delusion and different things of that nature. And the, the sad thing about it is it just does not go away. It's not something that you're gonna cure. You can stabilize, but usually in a couple months, you get a relapse. So it's not something that take these pills and everything is good. It, it never goes away. And we're seeing this at younger and younger ages is what our trend is. We take patients 18 to 65. We have a good number of our patients are under 25 years old. We had one patient we just discharged was with us for 48 years. So um, it's a chronic problem and a big cost. We're actually funded, we don't make a profit, we're actually funded through the lottery um, earnings from the state of New Jersey. So you know, everyone playing the Mega Millions and Powerball, that helps us. So keep playing those lotteries. But that's how we're funded. We bill Medicare and Medicaid. We're Joint Commission accredited. However, anything that we bill is offsets that state aid that comes to us. So there's a lot of pressure on us to create billing to the federal government. That just offsets what we're given by the state of New Jersey. Um, we take patients from Passaic and Middlesex County and other state patients. So we function basically like a state hospital. So I'm going to ask you, you could chime in, what do you, how would you define mental illness? It's a tough question. You hear it thrown out all the time. Oh, they're mentally ill. It was because of mental illness. What is mental illness in general? Anyway. Rational thought goes with it, absolutely. Well, basically, like the inability to use your brain in a way that helps you function a normal lifestyle. You, you hit the nail on the head. I mean, that's a perfect. That's, that's, right. <laughs> that's a perfect answer. I try. Right. Because what it is, it's, it's a disease of the brain, and there's various different diagnoses in that in mental illness. Just like you know. Diabetes, disease of the pancreas, it's a disease of the brain. And what it does, it affects your ability to operate under normal stresses of life. Um, you have trouble operating day-to-day -day activities. So what have you heard? Some of the diagnoses of mental health. What type of mental illnesses have you heard about? Schizophrenia. Schizophrenia. Bipolar. Bipolar. Dementia is a mental illness, very good. Depression, sometimes severe depression. Mania. Mania. OCD. OCD, and what goes along with that? How about traumatic stress disorder? You're hearing a lot of that, yeah. the military coming mm -hmm. back, yeah? Mm -hmm. That's a big one. Now that's just not a military concept. That happens from trauma. Uh, people who have trauma in their lives, I mean extreme trauma. And that also is a diagnosis that you get out of um, experiencing that trauma. Anything else? Sleep disorder. Sleep disorder. Sleep disorder. I don't know if that's a mental illness, but an eating disorder. I mean, the two hardest to treat disorders that we see are eating disorders or something you call um, borderline personality disorder. Anyone familiar with that? It's very hard to diagnose and very hard to treat. 
So basically, you're trying to treat somebody that doesn't think they're sick, right? They'll tell you you're crazy when you tell them that they're suffering from mental illness. You're giving them medications that have horrible side effects. You're going to gain weight. You're going to lose your hair. Become impotent, male. Um, horrible side effects with those. And they may not work. Right? So it's really a challenge. And especially in the public setting, because most of our patients, they don't have insurance, they're indigent, the family support is not there. And the majority of our discharges are to family members. But that's not always the best discharge. You think they're going home to their mother because mental illness sometimes runs in the family. And uh, that's not always the best discharge. And we often see them return. It's very rare. I would say maybe 10% of our patients we never hear from again. But the rest, they, they wind up somewhere else in an emergency room. And we take uh, referrals from emergency rooms is how we get our patients. Um, no one walks through the door and says, I need treatment. So we do take voluntary patients. But, um, Addiction right. would be part of the uh, mental illness too. Right? Absolutely. Addiction is categorized as a mental illness. Good. All right, so now. Mental illness in children is really is, is a big factor and is worsening. Um, you've seen about a 3% jump coming from, uh, you know, from 2012 to 2015. It's up around about, out of all the school age children, it's around 8.5% suffer, suffer from some type of mental illness. And the biggest one that hit the children are, is depression. So why would we, why would we see these numbers? What do you think would cause depression in children? I think that there are multiple factors why some might be depressed. You know, it could be a family dynamic, uh, losing a parent, um, also child abuse, um, neglect. So it's, I don't think there's one reason why a child can have depression, but it could be multiple factors why. Well, this class is great because you're, you're feeding right in, into what I want to talk about. That's a great example. Uh, what, you're, what you do see, and um, especially now in the African American community, you're seeing an increase in um, suicide among youth. And if you really look at the statistics, the suicide rates are predominantly white men. And why is this? Because what you look at is, in the, in the country, a lot of the, the states that have the highest suicide rates, like Montana, South Dakota, Oklahoma, what do we have there? You have a lot of ex-military, access to handguns, right? a lot of isolation, lack of services, loneliness is, is, is what happens there. So, um, but get, to get back to the school age uh, children issue and what you were speaking about, a lot of times what happens is you'll be in a, in a classroom and you have a child who's looking out the window, you know, in a daze and and they're diagnosed with attention deficit disorder. Well, maybe that's not the case. You know, oftentimes, how do you know what that children's going home to? How do you know they're not gonna come home and get beaten within an inch of their life, or sexually abused, or come home and nobody's home for them? You know, this is what's happening. So how do we fix this? I mean, I could sit here and advocate for mental illness and all of these different things, but there are some things that are being done I mean, what's happening now, you're seeing the teachers are going to be the front line of defense. They need to recognize these things. And there's some tough questions to ask. You're not always going to get the, the straight answer. But unfortunately, a lot of them resort to suicide. The bullying, you know, bullying is as worse as it's ever been. Even though you see a lot of preventative measures in place, it still happens. And it's severe. So how do we how do we address this issue? It's a major public health issue. I was a I was a substitute teacher in Florida at a point, and when I was a substitute teacher, I was doing junior high school, sixth to seventh grade students, and a lot of the times I came across students who they couldn't articulate what was really going on mm -hmm. and. And, and being a substitute teacher, you know, I really didn't have a lot to, to uh, input for them. But one of the things that I found to be very interesting with these students is that all of them 
we're getting bullied in some shape or form. And when I really tried to dig into what was happening, because there was this one girl, she would just come to class and cry. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Right. So this was like, to me, it was disturbing, of course, right? But then I was trying to, you know, and then when I went to make a complaint to the principal and other faculty members, they had no care whatsoever of what was that actually going on with these. They just wanted to get their paychecks and go through the day. So there has to be something more concrete for that issue, I think, that would help these kids more. You yeah, know? you know, again, you hit the nail on the head. And listen, when people commit suicide, especially children, they really don't want to die. That's not what the objective is. It's just they want all the pain to go away. Mm -hmm. And that's the last resort you see, and oftentimes they don't talk about it. You know, most of the people that commit suicide, they're never gonna say, hey, you know what, tomorrow I'm gonna commit suicide. They say nothing, there's no warning sign. They've never had mental health treatment. They've never been diagnosed with a mental illness. <clears throat> they just want all of the, what they call the demons and what have you, to just go away. So, you know, it's training and education. And what can we do to make these things happen? And during my introduction, I'll talk about some of the things. Um, you really have to be proactive, and it takes a lot of work, a lot of effort, and a lot of fighting, you know, for what you really believe in. And um, the mental health system, it's still stigmatized. I mean, you drive through a lot of towns, and you'll see signs of stigma-free town. Well, what does that really mean? What do you mean you're a stigma-free town? Right? When you're still using stun guns, when you run into a mentally ill person who's uh, stealing a bag of potato chips at the 7-Eleven, is that a really a stigma-free town? I am passionate about this, so I have to give you a warning. Once I, I mean, so once I found out like these kids were going through this problem, it's it's a bit of a self-hate, right? You know, so I, when I used to line them up for lunch, I used to have them line up and then hug themselves and say, "I would love no one more than I love myself." And then a teacher saw me do that, and she made a complaint, and then they took me into the office to say that I couldn't make them do that because. Right. It was a most, it was I public. see you're frustrated. It, it was well, terrible. It was, I was hurt. Yeah, you know, it's awareness. And oftentimes, you know, you have to share, you have to share concerns with the parents, but that's to me where be the problem is. Are you taking this back home to the parents and who knows where, where all of these um, mm -hmm. symptoms are coming from? You just really don't know. So you have to treat everybody very carefully. Um, it's a real difficult topic. A real difficult topic. Yes. So going back to um, you know two age children, um, what is the county doing in regards to educating teachers or educational institutions to be more aware um, about uh, mental illness and social depression? You gave a great example: children being labeled, and that is also a risk of a child. Um, that might be suffering from depression and is uh, displaying those uh, symptoms different than an adult and running the risk of being mislabeled as ADHD or whatever else. Mm -hmm. So what is the county doing in regards to empowering educational institutions to, uh, to recognize, and I don't know whether recognize is the right term to use, but to identify children are much possibly having some um, you know, uh, depression or issues that are happening in the family without going to the parents, because that is very important. How you um, translate that back mm -hmm. to the parents without insulting the family or making the family feel that, oh my goodness, mm -hmm. you know, my child has mental illness. Right. So, I would, is there anything that initiatives that you might have going on? Yes. Well, what we do to treat that is we have a whole division, it's run by our. Uh, uh, mental health director and what it is it's another grant funded program where we provide funding to all of the local providers that apply for the grant and it is children based it's solely for children with mental health um, so we have providers throughout the entire county once someone is diagnosed and need of assistance they're sent there and we provide the funding to the providers so that it doesn't there's no cost involved because one of the biggest barriers for treatment is cost. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I had a 19-year-old um, 
come I was speaking, come up to me and talk about his um, battles with addiction. And he says, you know what, I'm fortunate because my parents had enough money to pay for my treatment. Mm -hmm. So if you look at a lot of these, um, I'm diverting from your question a little bit, but um, if you look at a lot of these high profile, uh, these recovery centers, it's cash only, mm -hmm. take insurance, or they'll take insurance for a seven day inpatient stay, and it's enormously expensive. I mean, a 30 day stay may run $120,000. So the people that have the money, are seeing the treatment, but it doesn't always work. You know, drug addiction, typically you have five relapses before you can kick it. Same thing with alcohol. Alcoholism. It doesn't always happen on the first time, and rarely does it happen on the first time. So those are some of the programs we do. Also with the other the early intervention with the child, we follow them right up into high school age. So we have advisors that still meet with the families. Um, that's more on the autism, you know, on the spectrum of autism, but our mental health, um, and we have a mental health board that is appointed by our county executive, and they look into all of these social issues and recommend how the funding should be dispersed. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what part of the, um, the land have you used? Is predominant is or could be your uh, excess contamination level? So we, I guess you have to mention autism. Yeah, um, we we wouldn't see uh, we don't treat autism in our center. We have schizoaffective disorder. It's the most um, the, the high the highest diagnosed illness, which is where that's where you have it's just they're very delusional. And then on top of that, you get other things. You get a sexual preoccupation. You get a religious preoccupation. When I say preoccupation, when you talk to one of these people, that is all they talk about. You know, if, they, if someone has a religious preoccupation, all they talk about is God or whatever religion they believe in. And often that wasn't the religion they were raised with. So you can talk about them today and they're requesting to see a rabbi, and tomorrow they want to go to the Muslim prayer service. So that's, it's constant. And we provide all of those support groups. We've got every uh, religious, because we see so much of them, um, especially on the religion side. Right, you mentioned the preoccupation is the kind of the uh, you, you are about to think about psychiatric disorder. Yeah. Then how what is your the some guidance? Do you have some guidelines in your department? I, I don't understand the question. So guidelines. How you can the, uh, how you can communication with this kind of thing between your the uh, the teacher hospital okay. or some kind of health care? So what we do is we have a treatment team approach. So every patient when they come in, they get a, assigned a psychiatrist, a medical doctor, an internist, they get a social worker, someone from the uh, activity rehabilitation services department, uh, a nurse is assigned to them, and we also have different attendants and what have you. So we track that patient through this treatment team. They're team no less than once a month. When they first get there, they're seen every day for the first 14 days. And then you come up with a treatment plan. And this is what we're gonna try. And unfortunately, it doesn't always work. So then we change, we change the, the strategy and we come up with different, everyone in that team method comes up with something else that would be a better treatment plan. Um, our average length of stay is about 70 days in the hospital. And it is the most extreme uh, measure of care. We try to avoid bringing patients to our hospital because it's very restrictive. Can't come and go as you please. As a patient progresses, we give day passes they go for walks, they go shopping, um, they go out on activities, they go apple picking, everything we can do to try to integrate them back into normal everyday life. So, again, that's a very good question. So, we'll talk about suicide now, okay? We, we were talking about it, we didn't get off this right away. Um, Center for Disease Control, in 2016, suicide was the 10th leading cause of death, death in the U.S. So that's nearly 45,000 individuals per year. It, it ranges in age. However, the age group, I have this written down, I have to look at that, 10 to 34 is the second leading cause of death. So you're seeing that how it's affecting the, the younger. So why? Why are so many people committing suicide? 
We talked about the children. So usually what you see is a lot of times it's financially driven. Something happens, someone loses a job, desperation, no hope. So a lot of suicides after the, the great um, recession of 2008, the suicide numbers really skyrocketed after that event. Um, traumatic in episodes, again, a lot of isolation. You're seeing marriage rates drop in the U.S. As marriage rates drop, you're seeing suicide rates go up. I can't tell you if that's a correlation or not, but um, it's one thing to look at. It's possible that just utter loneliness that some people have. It's a really difficult topic because, again, you don't get a lot of warning signals. We have some patients that say, yeah, I'm going to kill myself, but that's attention seeking. You, know, you can go you sit down with them. Okay, why did you say that? And they really just want to talk to you about something. A lot of the times, you know, you don't get it. A lot of the people that are suicidal never seek mental health treatment. They really never go out and seek it or it's just not available to them, especially with children. Are there any specific times in the year where you see suicidal rates going up? And um, what about uh, undocumented? Um, you know, people, uh, do you have any stats on that in regards to, uh, you know, the uh, suicidal rate in, in uh, undocumented criminals? Oh, that's, again, you're going right in line with my talk. <laughs> um, the stats on that, although a lot of, um, we have several undocumented patients in our office, and we try, one we just um, come to the path of citizenship, got a citizenship, now you're ready for discharge. Because if you're in there, you have no access to any benefit. So um, you see spikes in suicide when you have high profile celebrity suicide. After you had the Kate Spade, Anthony Bourdain. Anthony Bourdain, after that, the emergency rooms were packed. Our referrals were through the roof. Usually that's when you see spikes. Well, if, you know, if they can do it, then of course me, who I have no notoriety whatsoever, um, that's usually when you see the, the numbers go up. And, and a, again, a lot of uncertainty in the world is what some of the explanations are. They're not sure what's going to happen, things of that nature. A very difficult topic. Okay. Now, there are some programs that have shown some success, especially Indiana and Connecticut are the only two states now where if say the police come to your house and you have a uh, permitted firearm in your house, if they feel you're a threat to yourself or others, they can seize your weapon. Because over 50% of suicides are done via handgun. Mm -hmm. So those programs are showing decreases in those states, in suicide. So you, you know, they say that's the easiest method to use. So um, that's been that's been a pretty successful program, but it's relatively new. Is it a permanent removal, or just until the person has been determined to be back to normal? Well, that's a good question. I mean, once you once you you're deemed a threat to yourself and others, I do not believe you'll see that that hand on come back. Okay. But again, if you or if you move and go to another state, usually the records are. I mean, we do statewide record checks. Someone who's applying for a handgun permit, and we handle that through the county too, all the handgun permit. So if you ever had a mental health commitment, you're not going to get a permit to buy a gun. But if I move to Montana, are you going to have it? It's not a national data bank, and that's what we're trying. We're working on. We're trying to get established. Um, a lot of that is is not easy. It's a, just a matter of data sharing. There's confidential information that a lot of states don't want to share. So. There is, oh, I see a question. Yes. Common method? A lot of them now, a lot of what you're seeing is ODs, prescription drugs. You see, um, unfortunately, hanging. There's various different methods, but those, those uh, probably most predominantly. Yes. Um, so I saw 
found that oh, we can't do it with the and the protocol to the and the But I know we have the age group for the So I think I would go to it as an academic data. Oh, you know, I'm not professing to be an expert in, in that area, but um, you do, you are seeing, you hear about it usually when you have someone of that age committing suicide, you make the national news. Um, a lot of times they'll give you the details on how it happened, and you really don't hear about that. And that's something they want to promote, uh, you know, on the, on the national news, but various methods. Well, it could be various reasons. Usually, the diagnosis is in bullying. It'd be severe depression. It could be brought on by bullying or home life or anything of that nature. What's going on? Some type of traumatic incident, losing a parent, things of that nature. Did you say earlier that the um, trend of suicide rate among young people has been increasing? Yes. So, uh, what would explain that? Because it, it wouldn't be a uh, family situation, I would think, or uh, you know, worries about the future, things like that. I, and I, I'm wondering if, if there's any evidence that has something to do with um, social media. Well, that's a that's a great point. And now there's a lot of arguments on that. Is what it is is happening? Much more reliance on you know you're, that's all you're doing. You become fixated on something. You know, you're not outside playing and doing things of that nature. You're, it's social media. It could be having an impact. I really have no statistics on that, but it's an excellent point, and it's believed that it is having some impact. I mean, what you see sometimes is what you do, unfortunately, and there's a lot of, you know, how many people they see actually where you're seeing people now that are dying because they're taking selfies in dangerous spots. The only reason you're doing that is because you're seeing other people do it. So a lot of times it's imitation. They're trying to do things they may say it may not be intentional. But uh, social media is having a huge impact. A huge impact on that. I wanted to talk about um, there's a, a, a Washington Post uh, journalist. His name is Pete Early. He wrote a book um, called Crazy, A Father's Search Through America's Mental Health Madness. Uh, it's a great book. And his son was diagnosed with schizophrenia at an early age. He was, I think, around 19 years old or so. And what he talks about in the book is about the struggles to get treatment and how his son was treated. And some of the things you're seeing that progress to, to try to handle this, but he had told a story about where his son was found in a neighbor's house taking a bath. Broke into the neighbor's house and decided to take a bath. So once they found him in the bathtub there, the police came. He was tased, handcuffed, thrown in the back of the, the police car, taken to jail for breaking and entering, basically. Um, and He's so passionate about this because it's a family member. His life has changed forever. So then on another occurrence, his son was picked up by the police, walking down the road naked. Now, a lot of times you see a lot of people with mental illness, they take their clothes off. Because they think if they take their clothes off, they can't be seen. It's obviously a delusion that is not true. So what happened this time, he had a police officer who was trained in what's called crisis intervention. And it's a 40-hour program. A lot of police officers are going through this program. And these are some of the things we're trying to do to promote for the, you know, the dignified treatment of people with mental illness. So he said to the officer, he said, I am not a criminal. Please don't put handcuffs on. Please, whatever you do. He said, okay. But I just need you to get into the back of the car. I need you to get to take you to the emergency room so you can get some help. So he gets him in the car and says, what type of music do you like to listen? But I really like rap. So he finds a channel with rap music on it. He's playing the rap music. He takes him to the emergency room. And then his father was called. His father came down. And the officer said to him, has your son ever threatened to harm you or harm himself? He said, 
and no. So you say, well, I don't advise you to tell the doctor that because he's going to discharge and he needs help. Well, so do you want me to lie? Well, basically, yes. So he told the doctor, yes, my son has threatened to hurt me. And he got the help he needed. But that's the way it works. If you walk into an emergency room, they're trying to move you in and out. Are you a threat to yourself or others is the question. Well, no, but you may be. But you see, when you treat somebody more humanely that way, your results are much better. A lot of times, people with mental illness just want to be heard. They can talk about whatever they want. As long as you're there and you just give them a nod, yeah. You know, that's okay. I understand exactly what you're trying to tell me. Thank you for sharing it. Everything comes down. Because we see events. We, we've had results in the hospital. We did a major performance improvement project. Our biggest risk is um, violence among patients and violence among staff. It's a tough environment, and it's very labor-intensive treating mental illness. So what we try to do is let's reduce the number of incidents of patient-on-patient -patient violence and patient-on-staff violence. So how on earth are we going to do that with our population? A lot of times, fights aren't good for mental illness. Like, listen, I don't like what's on the TV. You change or else I'm going to beat you up. Very rarely does someone just walk up and blindside someone on the side head. I'm hearing voices. It does happen. You know, I'm hearing voices that are telling me to hurt you. It does happen. However, we dropped our numbers over a three-year period. We cut our numbers by over 60%. We haven't used a mechanical restraint in over five years. And it's all through verbal de-escalation. And oftentimes, that's what it takes. So again, we use a seclusion room, but we use the door open. We want you to go in there, take a little bit of a time out, the way we use it. It seems to be working very well. Our numbers are unheard of, especially our restraint. We're, you know, it's a chronic, severe mental illness. We don't believe in mechanical restraint. Because all that does is sets the patient back. So our physicians really rarely do they. And there's things we did to make it, you know, you got to fill out about 50 different forms. But that's how we got our numbers. Listen, we don't want you to do it, so take the time to verbally DS. And that's what you're seeing with crisis intervention. You see police are your first responders. You have a domestic dispute, something going on in the household, police are the first ones there. Now, if they're not trained, what do you, what's the worst thing you read about or see on the news? Police officer shooting somebody over really nothing. You know, person's unarmed, they have mental illness. That doesn't justify shooting them. So that's what we're doing. Now, this is a national program. It's crisis intervention. And we've had in Essex County, our program is enormously successful. We've had over 500 individuals go through it. Now that includes federal air marshals, postal police, New Jersey transit officers. I don't know if you've ever been on a New Jersey transit train, how many times a train has to stop because some of the mental illness needs to be diverted off of the train. Someone comes on, they don't have a ticket, they wander onto the train, it could cause delays up to hours. So we're training the transit police. They let us use their facilities to do the training as long as we include their officers in the training. So that's how it is. Here it is. It's free for you to use, but you've got to train our officers because we <laughs> desperately need them. So that program has been working very well. Now with that at the same time, who can tell me what's the largest mental health treatment facility in the country? The Icon Hospital? Or Just mental health treatment facility. It's a trick question. <laughs> Congress. Congress? <laughs> Actually, you know what it is? Cook County Jail. Cook Jail. Cook County Jail, Los Angeles County Jail, and Rikers Island are the three largest mental health treatment facilities in the country. Right? Believe it or not. They, it's estimated over 400,000 inmates suffer from some form of mental illness. Now, I can tell you, in Essex County, we have over 600 inmates diagnosed with mental illness, and it's severe, some of them. They've committed some serious crimes, but others have not. It's just those simple, they need to be, you know, they're crimes of necessity, basically. I need something to eat, so I'm going to shoplift. Mm -hmm. I need a place to sleep, so I'm going to break into this house so I find a bed so I can sleep. 
I need to self-medicate because smoking marijuana or doing heroin makes me feel better. So I'm going to get, I get picked up on a drug charge now. So I end up in jail and we treat them. We have full-time staff that provide mental health treatment. But it's a chronic problem. And what we're trying to do is work on is trying to prevent them from getting into the legal system in the first place. So part of this, we've created this uh, jail diversion program, which was funded by a grant, but the grant has dried up. So we've continued to support it. But what we do is we work with the court. So in lieu of you going to jail, you've got to do X, Y, and Z and graduate from this program and your charges will be dropped. They just, they're, they're dropped off the books. So right now, we only can handle, we only have one clinician, we only can handle up to 30 um, clients in this program. We've had enormous success with the program. Um, and we do get some patients as part of this program. They do need some inpatient treatment. So we do see some of them at a program. Uh, I think Miami, uh, Dade County in Florida, they've had, they have a judge there who's really aggressive with the um, jail diversion program. And they've had enormous success with the program. They've dropped their recidivism rate by over 50%. They've, had, they've done some wondrous things, but they really had a bad system prior to that. They were really having some problems. Yeah. Uh, uh, how about you as a study, uh, uh, what is it, uh, of this effect of the public of our center, people suffering the hypothermia, and the word every every day. And or there is some the trend, some the on there. You know, it varies. It varies. The age, it varies, and the diagnoses vary. A lot of it is schizophrenia and getting back to the. Um, I'm sorry, not the juvenile? Well, you don't see that. And on the juvenile system, um, you're really not seeing the same. A lot of times, the mental illness doesn't appear, oftentimes, doesn't appear until, you know, 16, 17, where some of the severe cases start kicking in. But a lot of times in adulthood is when it appears. So for one reason, reason or another. About this point is you, you are the poor, I don't know how long that you had this uh, rehabilitation of uh, your patients and how you, what is your other um, relapse for them? Well, or depend on the age span or what the mind is. Well, the whole, really, the whole objective there is to get this person stable enough to get before a judge. So we work with our correctional facility where we have a program now where we actually give involuntary medication to stabilize them. They come in with such severe mental illness. And it's very controversial, but it, it works. And we rarely use it. We rarely have to use it because the treatment that we have in, in Essex County works really, really well. Um, but again, it's a real burden on our system because a lot of times they're there, they're in the jail for a long time. It's not, those cases aren't expedited very quickly. And then there's a forensic uh, correctional facility or psychiatric hospitals that they're referred to. But they only have so many beds. The forensic beds are very limited. New York State also has a system. New York State still maintains about 3,500 uh, inpatient psych beds, and there are forensic beds in those also, where you, you know, it's basically the seven, seven deadly sins. You commit a murder, a rape, sexual assault, things of that nature. You know, again, you don't want that individual out in the general public. But what we're trying to prevent are these, you know, these crimes of survival, where they don't belong in prison. It's How about the cost of, of the maintenance or some of the family proposals, the health care system in New York is access county? Is this is county. Private business? Or? I could tell you the cost between mental illness and addiction, which also comes from CDC is over $78 billion a year, either through being in the criminal justice system, healthcare, um, treatment costs, things of that nature. It's a big number. And the daily cost to just keep somebody in jail, um, it's also a big number. No, that's a national. That's a national number. No, 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 no. We are, you know, it's it's funny because that's the county of Jersey. It is a it's a it's a big county. Population wise, we're over eight hundred thousand, but a lot of the operations are large. Our correctional facility is the thirteenth largest in the country. We run the ninth largest prosecutor's office in the country. And we also have the ninth largest 
welfare department in the country. It's a, it's a big operation. And what we see every day, even recipients coming in for benefits oftentimes are suffering from mental illness. So um, you guys have great questions. You really have a good group here. I'm interested to know what has been your experience with that uh, stigma? You know, a mental health stigma in different ethnic groups or race groups, like in the Asian community. Um, you know, we're talking about uh, individuals committing crimes because of mental illness, but mental health, you know, is a public health concern. And uh, what has been your experience at this county, which is a very diverse county, uh, in regards to um, people access to mental health, voluntarily access, access to mental health services, uh, and uh, is, is there a difference from one ethnic group to the other? Yeah. Again, very good question. Um, I don't have statistics on that, but we do have seen an increase in Hispanic um, patients with mental illness. Uh, we also, again, when you say the stigma, because I was saying, alluding to earlier, the African American community really didn't deal with suicide. It wasn't that because it's so stigmatized um, in the African American community, you never saw the numbers. And um, a lot of other, you know, like in the Dominican Republic, where you see a lot of um, people believe it's more like witchcraft methods, really not mental illness. So we could treat this ourselves. We don't want anyone to know about it, and that's where the stigma comes from. So a lot of them do not go out and get treatment, so they're not falling into that statistical pool that we have no idea how many are not getting treatment. But we also, we, you know, we do have in our correctional facility, we do have a lot of, um, you know, we do have the, the ICE program, is, we do have inmates there, and they are, have access to full mental health treatment, um, and we do see a lot of it. And just, you know, again, desperation type type issues we see we see a lot um, but it's from all over the world. You your hospital serves Newark as well? Yes. Um, what percentage of your uh, patients come from Newark as opposed to other places in the country? I would say probably good sixty five percent. We do have a lot of patients that basically when they're discharged, they move to Penn Station. Once we place them in a secure housing environment, they don't like it and they wind up homeless and they, they live at Penn Station. That's fine. Um, well, a couple of things. So, as you were saying, mostly um, schizophrenia, right? Patients with schizophrenia, they don't show up until later in life, okay? And um, and I know this because I have this in my family. And a big thing that um, and I just saw a, I just saw a documentary that I just thought was very interesting too. Because what happens is um, if and when they become age that they're an adult, um, a lot of the problem is nobody else can speak for them. So they have this schizophrenia. They're in a treatment facility. And the parents, you know, can't make the decision, mm -hmm. right? So now it becomes they're an adult and they're allowed to make their own decision, which is usually not a very good decision. And that is huge among like your family trying to help you, your support system, people trying to help you. Um, and I just saw a documentary on PBS um, called uh, God Knows Where I Am. And it was about. Um, I kind of started watching it in the middle of it, and it was about this woman who is released. Her family doesn't know about it. Now, she's older. She's an adult woman, and she becomes homeless. She then finds a, a house that she just, you know, uh, an abandoned house that she lived in until the day she dies. She actually journalizes all her every day. She's writing in a journal. And I forget how they find, eventually find her, but it was so sad. Like her sister is saying, how nobody tell, told us she like if at least the law could be mm -hmm. that they inform a family member, you know, like that because that's not the institution that they um you know HIPAA and all these rules, you know laws that 
you know, nobody informed anybody that they had released her. And she was schizophrenic and didn't want treatment. And so eventually they released her, but nobody knew where she was, nobody knew she was released. And it just was so, so sad. And um, and I think that's a huge issue because you have sometimes, you know, a, 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 a family member who is, a, you know, um, has, you know, like we did not know that our relative had this uh, until they were hospitalized. And that's like the worst, you know, diagnosis you can come up with, right? For a person, they don't want to accept the fact that that's their reality. And that's that's how they have to, and they have to be medicated. Well, they wouldn't believe it either. Though. They don't believe it. And you don't know whether to believe them either because it's so out of what your the norm is, you know, on, um, I think people are after me. I think, you know, all the things they imagine. Um, That's paranoid schizophrenia. Oh my God, right. Class. And you really are like, you know, and the things that they imagine or they think that and the voices that they hear and you're kind of like, you know, you don't know whether to believe them or not, but until they're diagnosed and, you know, that, that's what happened. They were, they were below that age you know, that adult limit age, then they became above that age, and it was, okay, how, how can you help this person? Well, again, another really good point. So what happens when we have a patient that comes to us? We have a consent form, as if you're going in for acute care. Is there anyone in your family that you would like us to discuss your treatment with? The majority of our patients will give a name. Then we have to track them down through the social work process. But a lot of them do not. So then what happens is when someone is so incapacitated, they're appointed a legal guardian. It usually is not a family member. It's an attorney who does it pro bono. So you are now, so in other words, this person no longer exists, basically. You have a legal guardianship where you dictate the treatment of this patient. You agree or do not agree. Now, a lot of our patients over the course of stays with us have a lot of medical issues, too. You know, the, the average lifespan of a person with mental illness is cut by 25 years. And we see, you know, we see cancer, we see kidney dis disease, we see heart disease. We've got to perform all these services, which we have to negotiate rates to pay for. Again, they don't have the means of paying for this. We have to provide all of these medical services. So we've got to go to somebody to authorize. And just like you're saying, oftentimes we have nobody. So it's actually in New Jersey the state law. I'm the I'm the one who could determine for to intervene on a life saving measure for one of our patients, not even a physician. So you know if it's a life saving measure, you know anyone could deny treatment. And oftentimes we have patients that refuse to take medication. Yeah. I'm allergic to that. Well, you're really not allergic to it. You just don't like the way it makes you feel. Then there's a big difference. Yeah. And yeah, and it's. It, it, I mean, I think that even has to change. There has to be something that changes because I don't. I think that unless you go through it and you see, yeah, you know how how helpless you really are, and and in trying to help somebody, um, I think even the laws there, you know, there. I get the whole privacy thing, but when a person has mental illness and has schizophrenia, they are not in their right mind to be making certain decisions. So it's just uh, a. Yeah. Yeah, we do we do have a family support group that meets twice a month, where the families come in, and you know a lot of times some of the stories are tragic. We had a um, kid who came in 20 years old. He was full scholarship to NYU, academic scholarship. He was admitted for um, he had a bad experience with marijuana. We don't know if it was laced with something, but oftentimes they say marijuana is the precursor to schizophrenia, that it can bring it on, actually, in some studies. There's not a lot of evidence out there. You know, what comes first, the mental illness or the addiction? So what happened is this individual's life was ruined. He will never recover from this. You don't recover. You stabilize. You have your ups. You have your downs. But his future was so bright, and we see this a lot with the younger kids. A lot of it, you know, I mean, 50% of everyone with mental illness have a co-occurring addiction problem. Mm -hmm. So it's not just that it's the mental illness itself, it's the addiction that comes along with it. Again, a lot of the patients self-medicate, makes them feel better. 
you know, heroin may help you regulate your sleep. So there's really, it's hard to pinpoint. And I understand your frustration, and since you have you have a life experience with that, you understand where this is coming from. Oh, where you definitely. It, 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 it's unbelievable. It, you know, and, and they do. This person does, you know, is kind of in a bad environment, you know, lives with somebody, and they drink all the time, and, you know, they still think like it's a, it's a fun thing. And you're not supposed to do that on your medication, you know, first of all, when you're on that medication. Right. And, um, but there again, you know, if somebody told you that you were diagnosed with this, that's a hard blow to take. Oh, absolutely. You know, after you, you know, just were like this normal person supposedly prior to that, you absolutely. know. But, um, so we're yeah. running short on time, yeah. but I just wanted to cover, um, addiction because you're see, hearing a lot of addiction especially opioid abuse so 85 percent of all opioids are consumed in the united states 85 percent of everything produced are consumed in the u.s prescription so why what's what's going on what's causing this uprise i mean when opioids became popular in the early 90s physicians said these are not addictive it's going to make you feel the best. You're not going to feel the pain. And that's where you saw the influx of the opioid use. So now what's happening is it's also when you can't get them in, and some of the regulations on prescribing them it has improved, but you could buy a bag of heroin for $5. You need more and more. It's laced with fentanyl. That's killing people. It's so strong. So strong. And you know, I can't speak from experience, but the addiction problem is really hard to kick. Really hard to kick. So you are seeing some better regulations come in effect with uh, doctors prescribing the opioids. You're limited on the number you can get. They're still prescribing them. Right? There are some, you know, different pain medications that are not supposed to be addictive. That's what they said back in the 90s about opioids. You never know going to happen in the future with that. But we have a, a big problem. The numbers are staggering on the number of overdose those deaths in the U.S. I have some statistics written here that um, more than 72,000 deaths were estimated in 2017 from overdose. Whoa. Most of it from opioids. That's a big number. Now, we provide a lot of the Narcan, which is the opioid um, reviver, so to speak. And a lot of police officers who are the first responders on drug overdoses also, hey, listen, why should I do that? I'm only going to be back at this house again. I know this person. I've been here a dozen times. Every time I revive them, a week later, I'm there reviving them again. It, it really, it's a cycle like that, a cycle like that. We can't supply enough, enough of the Narcan fast enough. They go through the doses we give them like it's water. You just, you just can't keep up with it. It really is a severe problem. So um, the solution, any ideas? Because <laughs> it's very difficult. Treatment, obviously. Do you have data on the Narcan use? Do the, do the, do the, like every time a Narcan is used, is there like, you know, maybe a name of the patient, location, officer distributing, like a, circumstances around that? We collect that through our prosecutor's office because they spearhead on this because they don't want to criminalize it, which you're not seeing now. Like someone who ODs is not going to wind up in the, in the criminal system. So what's supposed to happen, you're supposed to report that every time they use it. But what happened now is like a lot of the municipalities put out on their own and we're not getting great data on it. We also have a Newark Beth Israel in um, Newark where that if you come in and use a Narcan to revive pain, they will give you one in exchange. Mm -hmm. So that's how we're also trying to collect the information. Um, just a lot of the statistics, but everyone's not going there. They're going to go to the nearest emergency department. So if someone is in the furthest western part of the county, get the newer to the furthest eastern part of the county, they're just not going to make that trip to get you know the antidote uh, replenished for that. But um, we were gathering 
great numbers or a task force involved, it's kind of weaned off because it's so widespread. It's just hard to track at this point. A lot of now the first aid squads have them. And you could go walk into a CVS and buy it yourself. A lot of them are in your medicine cabinet at home. So you're also seeing a lot of a lot of that, which doesn't, you know, it kind of gives you the wrong impression that it's okay to overdose. It really is not. Yeah. Right. That's it's kind of what's happening. They the needle exchange, you know, whether you give them the clean needle or, you know, you kind of, you know, reduce the epidemiology for transmitting HIV, but you're kind of supportive. You know, right. Well, the important thing is the same. The last thing I think FDA now discussed it, you know, and will be released, I think, the next few months to decide as the doctor prescription or how to deal with this drug. You, know, you basically say you can overdose, you know, this will work, save your life. You know? <laughs> so um, just to go through this, in the last 10 years, we've seen a twofold increase in overdose uh, deaths, mostly from opioids or a synthetic opioid, a fentanyl. So those numbers are um, severe public health issue. More than auto deaths now. I mean, oh, yeah. Auto deaths are always number four or five in the country as far as, you know, causes of death. It's been surpassed for several years now, hasn't it? Right. And, and any time we talk about these things, again, a mental illness, a diagnosed mental illness, because it affects the receptors in the brain, a lot of the people that abuse drugs will not admit they have a problem. Mm -hmm. It's like your typical alcoholic. When you talk to somebody, they don't think they have a problem. Mm -hmm. However, they can't function unless they drink three beers to start the day. But they don't think they have a problem. So a lot of times it's just they don't realize it and they won't get treatment. Mm -hmm. And that's probably the biggest problem why we're having such an epidemic. Well, uh, we have time for one more question. Yeah, sure. Okay. You know, uh, you're dependent on the federal or state or other grant. How much pressure you have it? You know, as I analyze the data, I clearly see when you discharge the those uh, mental health patients, mainly, you know, it's uh, their need the family support, the family burden you will see. When you see the those uh, patients, you want to discharge it, but they do not have enough family support or you know, family. Do you have a pressure to discharge them, or how you deal with them if your funding decreases? Good question. <laughs> See, what happens with, with our patient base, it's done a little differently. Our social work department works, and they're usually discharged with benefits. So either you get a social security disability, a monthly payment, Section 8 housing voucher for housing or just um, Social Security insurance, and you get a monthly stipend that pays for your housing if you don't have family support. However, some of this housing is a rooming home, boarding house, not the best environment where you can come and go as you please. Some are to shelter some of the discharges. A lot of times, what we call the A plus bed where you get really good treatment, where you have a nurse available to make sure you're taking your medication. A lot are taken by the state of New Jersey and they dictate who gets the beds and access. We used to have greater access to these beds. We just don't see them anymore. There's so many people in need of yeah. these discharges. And the whole philosophy is that discharge these individuals into the community. So in, in Montclair, we built this uh, 16 unit um, housing for the mentally ill. And it was fought tooth and nail not to build. It's always the NIMBY approach, not my backyard. They, it was fought like you wouldn't believe to build it. But it's one of the most successful programs we've experienced. You get your own apartment. You have other people there to talk about your issues with. It's working extremely well. So well that the people that move in aren't moving out. So now we, have, we don't have that housing available. So we need more. But that's a great point, And that's our biggest struggle. Now, grants are set up basically to give you seed money to start programs, especially in the public sector. We have a lot of availability of grants in the public sector, but they tell you, we're going to give you this money, get this program going, but we want you to continue the program. And that's often how it works, unfortunately. So, and a lot of this is just really good ideas behind it. Thank you. Thank you.
Hey, uh, Ken, why don't you turn that back? Thanks.